Um, as Mauro mentioned, it's a real pleasure for me to come and visit uh, this particular facility. I'm, I'm doing a, a small seminar tour, but I was very interested in coming to Trieste in part because, as he mentioned, um, Trieste is a, a member of an initiative that I actually helped moderate as part of a um, sort of a key uh, research um, focus for the Thermo Fisher Scientific Family, which now DharmaCon is a part of under the genomics. Um, umbrella. With this in, uh, initiative, which started in 2005 and several years later, ICGB in India, uh, sorry, Italy and in India, and then just this last year, South Africa have joined. Um, we now are represented by academic not for profit research screening centers. Um, these are 53 academic institutes, everyone who's engaged in some level of screening, whether with synthetics or express versions of silencing intermediates uh, and now cover, in a, in a real sense, global uh, perspective. We're 15 countries and five continents, and we continue to grow. The idea is to create a community, where, an open community, very much, I think, like the mission of ICGB, which is to share um, information and become a training center um, and to help people become fluent, if you will, in screening activities so that the, uh, the interesting part of a screen, which is not the setup and trying to understand assay development and optimization, but really to get at what are the interesting biologies uh, uh, for medicine, for example, to advance medicine. The community is quite active, um, and in just in the last year, we had a first community publication that was uh, published in Nature Methods by, led by Amanda Birmingham, who's, who's one of our bioinformaticists at Thermo Fisher Scientific, but included many uh, representatives from several of the groups who have bioinformatic capabilities. All right, so today I wanted to come, and, and uh, Miguel and Mauro asked me to speak a little bit about some of the tools that we offer, not just for screening, but for interrogating uh, gene function and gene, uh, the biology of, of various systems that you're, you're working on. Uh, as he mentioned, I started with the company when it was first known as Dharmacon Research, and it was a chemical synthesis, RNA synthesis company that was in a perfect position for when RNAi became um, a system to use in mammalian systems. It was routinely used in model organisms very easily, but never uh, had been useful or uh, applied easily in mammalian systems until Tom Tuchel was able to demonstrate that by using the short interfering RNA, you could actually gene specifically silence a particular um, target of interest. So what I wanted to do is, I think many of you are familiar with RNAi and have been using it at some level. Um, I'll start from a basic overview so that we can understand sort of where we derive these tools. I want to talk a little bit about sRNA tools and some of the history um, and the foundation of our research, which is to make functional and potent reagents, um, understanding the consequences of off-targets, where those come from. Um, I also, because I come from a technical support background, I like to say a little bit about controls and experimental design. Uh, we have some solutions for difficult to transfect cells. Uh, oftentimes, people work in very easy cell lines like HeLa and HEC293s, for example. Um, but in fact, when you're really looking at the biology, you want to look at clinically relevant cell types, but those tend to be the most difficult to work with, right? So this is something of focus that we've had for some time. Um, I won't have time to talk today about this. Uh, we have uh, chemical modification strategies, but we also have vector-based systems. Um, so if not today, I would love to come back or have one of my colleagues come back and speak to it, yeah? Um, the other thing is that I wanted to talk about some of the microRNA tools, and I think there's particular interest here in, as well in looking at microRNA biology, and so we have also derived some tools um, to interrogate the function and uh, effects of microRNA, tool, uh, microRNA biology, so mimics and inhibitors. Again, I always like to speak to controls. It's particularly difficult to create appropriate controls for microRNA, so I'll tell you about some of our work there and give you a story of um, how we use all the RNAi, RNA interference types of tools to look at a particular biology as an example. Um, we also, in addition to modulating gene, uh, uh, looking at gene modulation with sRNA and microRNAs, 
The other uh, downstream important part of an experiment is the uh, successful detection to be able to validate and confirm your results. Again, this is another story. It's something recently that we've developed. I don't know that I'll have time today. I'll watch the clock. Um, and if uh, I'm happy to speak to it if we have time, but if not, then I can come back as well and speak to this. So I don't think I need to, to really explain to you the importance of RNA interference. It has clear implications in, in the early days simply in identifying genes of interest and in elucidating uh, the components of a particular pathway. In this case, it was the endocytotic pathway, um, evaluating biomarkers and obviously has clear implications in, in biomedical research in terms of target validation, but also sRNA or microRNAs actually being used or considered as therapeutic strategies or tools. I'm going to start with a very simple cartoon to illustrate how we've borrowed this natural pathway, highly conserved pathway, to develop a variety of different tools based on different points of entry in the pathway and based on the functional intermediates. Um, that affect silencing or repression. Um, what Dharmacon, the legacy Dharmacon group, was known best for was uh, uh, ready chemical synthesis of sRNA. Not just synthesis, though, but the R&D group really spent a lot of time looking at how we can rationally design these sRNAs so that they're the most functional and potent based on what we understand about the biology of this native pathway. I'll spend some time talking about the, how we've applied what we've learned about making sRNAs, not just synthesizing, but actually designing them, to creating microRNA uh, mimics, so they simulate true microRNA function, um, but then also looking at inhibitors. Uh, we recently, in the past year or so, acquired a company called Open Biosystems. They are now part of our uh, sister company, if you will, and they have tremendous expertise in the design and creation of express versions uh, based on microRNA-based shRNA, short hairpin express versions, or the simple hairpins. Again, I won't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but I wanted to give you a sense of how we've taken the, the native pathway, really interrogated how the, uh, what is the biology of this pathway, and then where can we create tools based on the natural um, pathway, and really borrow and use that to our advantage. Uh, the R&D group at Dharmacon has a very strong publication record. Um, we started in 2003 and 2004 with several publications in Cell um, in conjunction with Phil Zamor to look at what were the, um, the elements or what were the drivers behind functional activity of an sRNA. Uh, we then published in Nature Biotechnology and Nature Protocols um, the fact that you could, in fact, rash, rationally design, that you could really look at both functional and non-functional sRNAs and come up with a strategy or an algorithm to help us design the most functional sRNAs. And then we also published a basic um, sort of protocol or method for um, how you could do that yourself. Obviously, we have a proprietary algorithm, but we also make an element of that available so people can design their own on our web page. What we learned from that early work and what came out in the publications, what we understood about potent sRNAs is that um, it's not sufficient to look at random selection. You see between two and one nucleotide base pair difference, you see something that's very functional versus um, non-functional. So non-functional sRNA here would be something that uh, has little expression, so high bar and a low bar is very functional. You shift the sequence just by two bases and you render it essentially non-functional. So again, that gave us an, a clue that there were rational methods or strategies for design. The other thing that we found with very potent sRNA, so potent would be this light blue bar relative, and F95 was a, um, how we designated function, so function of 95% knockdown of the mRNA versus 70%. Anything less than 70% we don't consider very functional, but the idea is that the more functional the sRNA, the longer duration of silencing. The other thing is that uh, with very functional sRNAs, you can use very low concentrations, and that's important because at high concentrations, you have the potential for nonspecific effects that complicate the results. So these were the things that we were looking at when we created the algorithm, and it was really looking at individual properties of functional sRNAs to um, increase potency. We, we did this a very systematic way um, where we did a sRNA walk, looked at the function, and considered the attributes of both non-functional and functional um, sRNAs, created a multi-component algorithm, 
and then used this to predict sRNAs and then tested those predicted sRNAs to determine function. And we found that the strategies that we were, were using were very successful. This is actually a data set from one of our um, uh, collaborators, and this is the Kinome set um, of data that they provided showing that the green area here represents 75% or better knockdown of the mRNA. So you can see that we have a pretty good um, a track record, if you will, for creating functional sRNAs. The next thing that we looked at, obviously, were there are consequences. It's not entirely surgical. There are nonspecific effects. And so we spent some time trying to understand what were those off-target or non-specific um, non effects, um, because they do complicate your ability to interpret the data. We also looked at um, what were some of the things, whether it's delivery or sRNA-specific, that could lead to sort of nonspecific or even toxic phenotypes. So it's very clear that when we look at um, sRNAs at high concentrations relative to low concentrations and we're looking at the expression profile of, of a particular RNA experiment, and this was work uh, performed by one of our collaborators at the time, Amy Jackson, who was then at, the, uh, at Rosetta Informatics. And so this is the target gene that we're looking at, but you can very clearly see that the off-target signature is concentration dependent. So all you need to do is reduce the concentration to minimize the background effects and really pull out the, the phenotype of interest. So our question was how can we, um, with the idea of concentration, you still need a certain amount to get very potent knockdown. So what are some of the ways that we can manipulate the concentration? When we first came out with this idea, it was very controversial because many people said if you include four sRNAs, you're adding the off-target phenotype or the off-target signature would be additive. But actually what we found is that if we designed to distinct sites in the, in the um, particular target um, and we tested many different pool combinations from two up to higher complexity pools, we found that you got the best knockdown at uh, best reliable knockdown with simply four sRNAs. So it's a low complexity pool, gives you very effective knockdown, and you effectively reduce the concentration and the, contri the contribution of the nonspecific effects associated with each one. And so that's illustrated here in this microarray. And we're looking at those um, off-targeted genes. This is target knockdown. We're looking at individual versus the pool at 100 nanomolar concentration. Today, that's a very high concentration. Now when we screen, we typically screen at 50 nanomolar or lower. But at the time when the early studies were um, performed, we did these at um, 100 nanomolar. What you see is that while each sRNA is very good at targeting its, uh, the gene of interest, they have very different signatures, and that you minimize that signature when you combine them into a pool, a mix. Again, we think this is essentially manipulating the concentration, lowering the concentration, and lowering the off-target effects. So we spent a lot of time looking at uh, concentration, looking at lipid delivery type um, uh, methods, different types of lipids, because those also have signatures. The next thing that we looked at was specificity. So we know that um, while the idea is that it's surgical in terms of an sRNA that's designed for a particular target, um, there is a potential for off-target, so, so we wanted to understand what that was. We can use pools to reduce the, the uh, concentration, but uh, when you design multiple uh, sRNAs against a single target, again, this was work done with Amy Jackson uh, um, at Rosetta Informatics looking at MAPK14. It's a very nice paper, um, but one of the pieces of information is that while you design sRNAs that are very good at knocking down RNA or at the protein level relative to a control, each sRNA has a unique signature. So while it's functional, it doesn't necessarily mean it's specific. So the question was, what is driving this off-target activity? So I'll go back to another cartoon, again, very simple. Um, what we're doing is we're borrowing a native pathway. The natural pathway in plants might be sRNA related, so it was a protective mechanism against viruses. But in mammalian systems, it's really the microRNA pathway where you have these non-coding transcripts transcribed in the nucleus that are processed, exported into the cytoplasm, where they're very efficiently processed by DICER very quickly into the functional intermediate, which is not 100% complementary, but is characterized by um, mismatches and bulges, right? And so this functional intermediate is incorporated into risk, and the functional strand, the guide strand, or the mature strand, 
then drives the activity. If it's partial complementarity, you have translational repression. If um, in some cases mRNA degradation, usually if there's 100% complementarity. So again, I just wanted to review that with you because what we understand about microRNA function is that it's the seed region, what we call the hexamer seed region or heptamer, depending on what research or uh, scientists that you, you read, they look at positions two through seven in the uh, functional strand. This is the driver behind function of a microRNA, right? So these bind typically through partial complementarity, most often to the three prime UTR of the uh, of, sorry of the target mRNA, and affect primarily in mammalian systems uh, degradation. Sorry, not degradation, but translational block. So you can imagine when you're working with sRNAs that even though you've designed for 100% complementarity, if that seed region is shared with a known microRNA, this is what we think is the primary driver behind those off-target effects, right? So understanding this from a bioinformatics strategy, but also because we have a very good chemical synthesis team, we can actually test a variety of different chemical modifications which we apply to, in this case, um, to the strand, the potential strand that would be entering risk. So let me back up. Everything being equal, a duplex, the cell sees that it can load one strand or the other. We know that in nature there's a bias towards that strand, so we can chemically drive that bias by introducing um, chemical modifications that make the opposite strand, the non-functional strand, or the undesirable strand, um, unavailable to load into risk. So we can drive activity for the desired strand just by modifying the opposite strand. But by doing that, you actually increase the concentration of the functional strand. And remember what I said about f uh, when you increase function, uh, sorry, concentration, you actually increase the potential for off targets. But now they come from the guide strand, right? Um, and so what we can then do is take uh, chemical modifications of a different style or pattern, apply them to the guide strand, and now we We've modified the sense or the passenger strand so that it does not load into risk. We modified the guide strand so that it favors 100% complementarity and discourages that partial complementarity. So by doing, using these strategies, we can really drive that sequence-specific target knockdown. So when we combine that with pooling strategies, combine that with uh, chemical modifications, if we take our standard and this is the basis of our SI genome, which is the collection that uh, you have here for the screening facility. Well, again, it's very good at targeting. If you look at target knockdown mRNA, so yellow is the unmodified strand and blue is the modified, um, uh, modified uh, molecule, you see that you, you significantly reduce the off-target signature. It doesn't mean that you eliminate it, but you significantly reduce it, right? It's a probability. It's never black and white. But the idea is that now uh, you can create these more specific molecules. Um, so again, these are very good for large screens when you're doing sort of a fishing expedition, identify targets of interest. And then if you want to confirm the, the phenotype, you can come back with these uh, more specific uh, specificity enhanced reagents to make sure that the phenotype is true to the knockdown of the gene and not a consequence of the constellation of effects, right? All right, many times people, uh, my preference is when someone's working with RNAi, you want them to say that they look at mRNA knockdown, but more often than not, people look at phenotype or protein reduction, right? One time removed from the actual event. And this is um, important to use these very functional sequences because if you start out looking at large numbers of gene targets as you might in a screen, whether whole genome or a kinase screen, for example, um, you want to make sure that the phenotype is true to the actual knockdown event. So this comes from a collaboration that we did with the Joan Bruges lab at Harvard University. Um, they're connected also with the RNA Global um, membership and, and uh, the, they came out with a very nice paper looking at wound healing. In this case, this was a, a known gene target with a known phenotype. And the, the expected phenotype was this. So the idea is that you create a monolayer you scratch the surface, and it, uh, uh, then you look for the cell's ability to uh, heal, 
or uh, if you see increased toxicity. So you knock down genes and look at what their role is in that healing process, if you will. It's a very simplistic way of describing a very complex morphological change. When we look at the individual sRNAs, uh, these were rationally designed. You see at the mRNA level, very good knockdown, but you see a wide variety of phenotypic effects. So, and based on what we knew about the particular target, we knew that these weren't true, that this was likely the true phenotype. So you have a more closed, toxic or open, and unaffected. When we pool these reagents into a single, uh, pool the individual sRNAs into a single reagent, again, you see very good uh, knockdown at the mRNA level, but the phenotype is still a little suspect. When we go back and use these specificity enhanced, so both strands are modified um, to reduce the nonspecific effects, whether sense or anti-sense strand, again, very good knockdown. But now you start to see that the phenotype is more true to what was expected. And when you, when you uh, include these into a pool and use these, um, you again see a very good knockdown, but the, the phenotype is more expected. So this was a good control and, and provided confidence first in using the original collection, right, the foundation collection, but then also the specificity enhanced collections. And this is important, again, when you're doing large scale screens. Uh, because if you're looking at phenotype, you want to be confident that the, the, uh, what you see reflects the true knockdown and not the off-target effects. So what I wanted to just explain to you was the, the foundation of, of uh, our strategies that we apply virtually to any tool development. We rely heavily on a very strong bioinformatics team that looks at um, uh, what are the uh, uh, rational aspects based on the biology, what do we understand about base preferences, what do we understand about motifs like seed regions. Um, because we have a very talented R&D team, a chemistry team, we can look at a variety of different chemical modifications. And because we understand something about the biology, we can look at uh, strategies like pooling. In this case, it was a way to decrease the effective concentration. And what you see is that uh, when we look at the, our original SI genome, what we call SI genome collection, the range of off-targets is significantly reduced as you go to pooling and as you add the spe uh, specificity enhancing strategies. Even this, less than or uh, on average about 100 off-targets is a really clean signature um, relative to other types of sRNAs that you might see, um, but still uh, demonstrates the, the function and specificity of these uh, targets. So again, because I come from uh, the technical support department, um, one of the things we talk to um, scientists all the time when we're trying to help troubleshoot their experiments, one of the first questions that we ask when they're having trouble is what controls do you use? And it's very often that people don't always have the best controls or, or maybe try to um, save a little bit of time and space by not including the controls. Oftentimes you find that your controls outnumber your experimental reagents, right? And that's a good experiment. Uh, what we're looking for, and again, these are based on recommendations that were published back in 2005 specifically for setting up RNAi type experiments. Um, but the idea is that you want to um, obviously have your experimental sRNA that will give you uh, information about the sequence specific effects, but then you want to include types of controls that will um, assess or uh, help you understand what the non specific effects are. You obviously want a positive control, not just for uh, silencing, but also for delivery. Um, the mock transfection, untreated cells, and then you can use strategies like rescue, uh, again, as confirmatory types of experiments. So within these categories, we have a variety of um, different types of controls. Sometimes it seems overwhelming, but it's always important to look because each cell is different, and they'll respond to non-targeting or non-specific controls differently, and we find this. Um, on many occasions, we've developed a variety of controls because we don't know how cells will, will respond. I actually took, this is a very popular slide that comes from one of the RNA Global um, Initiative meetings. This was a, a group at MD Anderson that I helped work with in the uh, beginning. They had one negative control um, that was killing their cells. And so what we did was we asked them to test a variety of different controls. And based on that follow-up, their conversation and follow-up uh, follow experiments, they developed a strategy and optimization matrix that this is a, in a 384 well format. They use it for screening, but it's actually not a bad way to screen quickly for um, experimental conditions where they can actually test different lipid reagents. 
Um, the red actually, and this is a, for a viability assay, they're testing a variety of different S, uh, sRNAs against targets known to be involved in um, cell cycle pathways and, and have viability phenotypes. So this is PLK1, this is KIF11, COP B2, and this is a toxicity control. The pink and orange represent non-targeting controls. We have five non-targeting controls of the SI genome, so unmodified flavor. Um, and then we have four that are modified with the specificity enhanced strategy. And so what they do is they run an entire experiment with cells alone and then these different sRNAs. And based on this matrix, they can identify the best conditions for cell number, the best lipid, and then the best killing control, targeting control, and the best non-targeting control. And so in a matter of days, they can um, optimize their experimental conditions so that then they can have a very successful um, downstream screen. So this is just a summary slide to tell you about all the different reagents that we have. In fact, here at this uh, core facility, um, you have access to uh, the whole genome collection for the human um, as smart pools. Um, these are based on the RefSeq database. So these are NM records, uh, and as we version our collections, we look more at those NM records that have experimental um, uh, basis for being a true open reading frame. It used to be in the past we would include XM or predicted collections. Um, they come in different flavors. I talked to you about the foundational collection, the specificity enhanced collection. And then for those of you, again, I'm happy to talk to those who are working with the um, very difficult to transfect cells. Those tend to be neuronal cell types or hemopoietic cells, primary cell types with basic lipid uh, mediated uh, methods or strategies. Um, we have developed a molecule that doesn't, it's lipid independent. And so, um, again, I don't have time today for that. Um, but I'm happy, I have some data if people would like to stay and talk some more about that. The next thing I wanted to talk about was um, microRNA tools. So we, we tested ourselves and our ability to um, de design and develop functional sRNAs, but we really wanted to look at sort of the microRNA um, pathway as well, because that's also very interesting, um, very complex, very complicated. Uh, the consequences of microRNA uh, biology and, and gene modulation are very subtle, but have very important consequences in a variety of different systems. So again, my cartoon and what I want to do is focus on the fact that we can synthesize uh, microRNAs uh, to reproduce or represent, to supplement. You can add these into the cell to supplement or add a microRNA to a cell that has very low or no expression and then look at the consequences. Um, we can also, uh, we've also developed a, um, some potent inhibitors that will interfere with microRNAs, and so then you can look at the downstream consequences. With sRNAs, you're looking at knocking down a particular gene, so you lose gene function. When we talk about microRNAs, they modulate a particular gene, typically by repression. So when you add a mimic, you, the downstream consequence is to decrease the gene product. Um, when you look at inhibitors, you actually are looking for um, upregulation of the particular gene. So it's important to think about that um, when we look at some of the data. I wanted to put this slide up because while this cartoon is very simple for the pathway, in fact, we know from more recent research that's been presented at recent conferences that the microRNA biology, as I said, the processing is quite complex. Um, and so we know that there are alternative pathways and alternative um, structures that we are not quite sure uh, we have predictions about what the role of these alternative pathways are. But um, I just wanted to point out that it's uh, not as simple as the, the cartoon before, but still um, we can create these reagents to help us understand um, the microRNA biology. What's complicated about this particular pathway is that a single microRNA, unlike an sRNA, it's designed for a particular gene target. A single microRNA can regulate literally hundreds of, of messages as an individual, right? Um, at the same time, a single microRNA can work in concert with other microRNAs to regulate particular gene targets. And so, in, in, in turn, the uh, consequences can be very subtle, not very obvious. So again, it's a very complicated um, biology, very interesting, um, but has significant consequences, consequences in a variety of different um, aspects of biology, whether development and stem cell renewal, um, in differentiation, um, and also 
when dysregulated or improperly or aberrant regulation occurs, uh, it's implicated in disease and pathologies. So it's, uh, again, a very interesting biology that people are starting to turn uh, their attention to. Things that are interesting about microRNAs is that they, again, they're these non-transcribed uh, or transcribed non-protein coding sequences. They represent a very small fraction of the genome, but in fact have uh, the ability to regulate uh, a large fraction. So again, I have numbers here, but depending on who you read, they, everyone has a different uh, version. But again, a small fraction of the genome transcribes or, or produces these microRNAs, but can regulate up to 60 to 70 percent of the human genome. All right, so with this in mind, uh, we had a lot of interest in understanding how microRNAs function, what their targets are, not so obvious. So we've spent quite a bit of time in designing uh, appropriate tools for microRNA, interrogating the microRNA biology. The, in the simplest form, we're looking at mimics that we can supplement or augment acti activity. Most of the designs uh, are based on what's recorded in the, in the microRNA uh, database, the MIR um, uh, base at Sanger Center, and our collections are based on those that are highly conserved across human, mouse, and rat. So we don't have designs against every microRNA, but we have those against the human, mouse, and rat based on the conservation across those. So we look at families and whatnot. Um, we do take, uh, uh, take advantage of the chemical uh, modification pattern to produce strand bias because there is a guide or active strand. Um, the alternative strands that I referred to before is passenger strand. In microRNA biology, it's oftentimes considered the star strand. The complication with a star strand from the mature sequence is that sometimes it can also have activity. So we might have a microRNA where either strand can be modified so that it allows us to look at function of one strand versus another. Um, those chemical modifications, again, we're looking for binding specificity and efficiency and also trying to minimize the nonspecific effects characterized by interferon response. Because we don't always know what the microRNA targets are, we had to come up with a way to test our designs um, using this dual luciferase um, strategy. So you'll see a lot of data associated with uh, uh, the ratio of uh, luciferase expressed, whether the human versus the ranilla. We clone the target site of a microRNA into the, the ranilla luciferase and look at the ratio of expression. So that's how we measure whether or not the microRNA is functional. So in this case, when we introduce a microRNA mimic to supplement activity um, where there's no effect, as you might see with nonspecific control or non-function, the ratio is approximately one. When you actually um, see function, uh, the mimic inhibits the, uh, at the 3' UTR, um, inhibits are the ranilla luciferase, and so you see a decrease, so a ratio less than one. All right, so we're looking at native mimics, and then 2 primal methyl modifications were something that many researchers used to modify and improve potential function of the microRNAs. We actually included 2 primal methyl modifications plus modifications to um, promote strand bias. And what you see is that with this type of modification, the ultimate tool that we developed, what we call meridian uh, mimic inhibitors, um, shows very, very good function in terms of repressing luciferase expression in this sort of artificial reporter system. So in this case, we're working with HeLa cells at 10 nanomolar concentrations, so very potent at low concentrations, right? I wanted to show an example. There's many um, uh, examples in the literature. Now we're seeing increasing use of mimics in the literature, and I, I just picked one. This is an open source. Um, publication from last year, and what they were looking at was microRNA 34. Um, it's expressed in a variety of cell types, but in particular, they were looking at a pancreatic cancer cell model. Um, what they do know, or what's understood about the biology, is the MIR 34 is the target or regulated by p53. In this particular human pancreatic uh, stem cell line, p53 is deficient. Um, and so, by uh, looking at what putative targets were expected, for the MIR-34, it's thought to play a role in stem cell um, self-renewal and, and uh, acting via the BCL2 and NOT. Um, so here's an example of the normal tissue, and when dysregulated, you see this um, uh, huge, so these are stem, the huge growth in, in uh, 
the, the tumors as a result of the dysregulation of the stem cell population. So by introducing the MIR-34, you actually rescue that P53 deficiency. And so um, <coughs> the idea is that here's an example of using a mimic that potentially has therapeutic potential or a therapeutic uh, uh, helps us think about therapeutic strategies. So again, this is one publication that um, I had pulled out just as an example of using this. Um, we have several other examples. Um, again, coming back to the tech support roots, I look at the design of uh, positive controls. So again, we don't have good controls because we don't always know the targets. Um, so we're looking for something that helps you um, when you're setting up an experiment, you don't know the target, you need to know whether or not the experimental design is going to be functional. Um, what we wanted to look at were uh, known microRNAs. In this case, uh, in surveying the literature, uh, the R&D team identified MIR-122. Um, it was a good uh, candidate for positive control because it's uh, well conserved across human, mouse, and rat as the microRNA, but also the target is very well conserved. And they knew the, one of the targets, one of the few microRNAs today that they know the actual target, which is aldolase A. Uh, this microRNA was attractive as a potential control because it's well expressed in a variety of um, cell types, and so you can actually document the uh, regulation when you supplement with the mimic. I made note of the, um, oh, I said HEC293 here is little to no expression. In fact, it's a HEP G2 has little to no expression. So what I wanted to show was the utility of this particular positive control. Again, it's only going to tell you something about your experimental conditions when you do that side by side with a microRNA of interest. But what I wanted to show you here was the utility of this um, positive control in a variety of different cell types, human and mouse in, the, in this case. But I also wanted to um, uh, point out a couple of things where um, introducing the mimic reduces the expression of aldolase A. Um, by cell type, they're expressed in the cell type, but you use different uh, concentrations to see the consequence of the, the repression, right? So, in these cells from HeLa, MCF7, HEC293s, et cetera, the best concentration was 50 nanomolar for the most repression. Um, we worked with 40 nanomolar uh, for optimal uh, uh, repression in HUS, uh, the HUH7. And then I wanted to point this out, that HEPG2 has very little to no de uh, detectable expression of the MIR-122. Um, and so what you see is something that's not quite a dose response curve, and we think this is something to do with the biology of the cell. It's not adapted. It doesn't have a means to regulate um, aldolase A, certainly not by MIR-122. So it's just something to point out when you're using these as controls and to think about and consider. The next microRNA tool then obvious, uh, of obvious interest would be something to inhibit function, so microRNA inhibitors. Um, and this, you'll, you'll remember the publications out of um, Al Nylum and I think also Tom Tuchel, uh, they were uh, initially referred to as antimers or antagomers. Um, and so, uh, along with many others, we investigated different types of designs, which were a simple sort of antisense strategy where you're looking at the reverse complement to the microRNA to see if you can't bind or inhibit it. Um, Annalie and Vermillion, who's one of our R&D scientists, uh, looked at designing uh, reverse complement sort of strategies, but then extending five prime and three prime to see if they couldn't stabilize this inhibitor. Uh, what she eventually came to and what she's published in RNA in 2007 was that the most potent molecule was a structure that extended the five prime and three prime from the reverse complement, but included secondary structure that seems to anchor or stabilize that particular inhibitor. Um, so we look at uh, uh, the utility of this uh, inhibitor in a cell culture system over the course of two weeks. And you see that uh, th uh, the molecule that incorporates these types of secondary structures has far more um, specificity and function and potency over the course of a two-week period. This is important for sort of long-term types of experiments. And this is relative to sort of a standard um, design from other suppliers that we think are, tend to be reverse complement strategies. The other thing that Annalian tested is that microRNAs, I, I didn't mention earlier, but there are cases where microRNAs are actually transcribed in clusters as a transcriptional unit. So we believe that by being transcribed as a transcriptional unit, they probably have a, a coordinated effect on their particular gene targets. The one in particular that I've mentioned here is 17, 18A, 19, 20, 19B, and 92 represent what is commonly referred to as a cancer cluster. 
Um, so what she did was actually looked at the ability to multiplex or use these inhibitors as a pool and see if she couldn't affect um, knockdown. And in fact, so um, these experiments, what we're looking at here, again, it's using the reporter system. Um, the cells, the experiment represents a pooled transfection, but we're actually detecting the knockdown uh, with the reporters, so individual reporters. But the, the, the idea is that you can actually multiplex these inhibitors if you're looking at uh, multiple microRNAs that may play a role in a particular uh, biology or gene target. Again, I, I like to pull out examples in the literature. More recently, this is a group uh, that published in PNS 2009, where there was a correlation of a microRNA 182 and the, um, the progression from a primary melanoma to a metastatic melanoma, which is a very aggressive um, disease. And th they were able to correlate uh, the, the MIR-182 expression as potentially diagnostic for poor, pr um, poor prognosis. And the idea is that you can actually use the inhibitors to interfere with this, um, the barren expression of uh, MIR-182 and sort of rescue this metastatic um, uh, 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 phenotype. So you see the reduction in cell number and then um, an induction of apoptosis when you introduce the inhibitor. So it's just an example again of, of how these microRNAs are used to, to interrogate the biology, but now you can start to think about some therapeutic strategies. Uh, this is another example published in circulation where the microRNA 320 is implicated in uh, a, um, a cardiac injury, this uh, uh, in vivo and in uh, sorry, in vitro and an in vivo model. So again, people are starting to use these um, as, uh, as ways to interrogate the biology, um, but then also it has clear implications for therapeutic strategies downstream. So I'm sorry I won't go into a lot of detail, but hopefully the, if you have those publications, you can take a look at these. Again, controls are very important for any of these experiments because since we don't know the targets and we don't know the downstream consequences, we'd like to have something for which we know that the, the function uh, what the activity is, and so it gives us an indication that at least the experimental design is uh, working. Uh, we looked at a variety of different um, uh, potential uh, uh, controls uh, for inhibitors, MIR-16 and MIR-21. We're looking for those that are expressed and so rel relatively easy to detect. In this case, we're using a detection not of a phenotype, but using actually quantitative PCR. So we can transfect the um, cells with the hairpin inhibitor. The hairpin acts as a sink. It irreversibly, we believe, binds to the microRNA and makes it unavailable for function. So by quantitative PCR, um, the conditions for uh, detection are such that you don't melt that, that complex or that duplex, as it were. The secondary structure is so strong. So while we're not looking at function, what we're looking at is unavailability with increasing concentrations of the inhibitor. It's not available to, to affect function. Um, and so this is one method to detect um, the effects of your inhibitor. So I, I've spent some time talking about the controls, but I, I, what I want to leave you with, um, and I have a little bit more in about 10 minutes, and I know uh, that people's time is precious, so if you need to leave, feel free to, but I'll continue as we're able to. Um, but what I wanted to leave you with is whether you're working with sRNA or microRNA experiments, you want to think about the target genes that you're looking at. Consider what sort of the, um, the variants, what, is, what do you know about the biology, what are the gene families involved, and this can help you in terms of uh, the types of reagents you use, whether sRNA or microRNAs, and, and sort of rationally design your experiments, if you will. Um, it, we have come across occasions where someone's having trouble with a particular experiment, but they're working in a cell line where that target isn't expressed or not well expressed or very difficult to detect. And so you want to think about the cell line that you're using. Um, they're easy to transfect cell lines. That's obviously a consideration, but then is it, is it clinically relevant, right? Um, optimization of delivery. I showed you the matrix for selecting controls and delivery reagents. It's very critical. It's not going to work if you can't get it into the cells. And you need to have sort of the non-specific controls as well as the positive controls. Um, and obviously, you want to look at the reagents and consider how functional and potent they are, but also what are the elements of design. So taking into consideration the fact that seed region is important. We know it has a, a, a specific effect. So you want to include all of these elements, the positive, negative controls, um, multiple reagents. The reagents that I described represent a variety of uh, distinct reagents that will help you 
um, interrogate the biology and give you more confidence in the results that you're, uh, you're getting. Um, so what I wanted to finish with is actually a, a sort of a short story. It's some work that we did in the, within the R&D group that sort of brings everything together um, in terms of using microRNA reagents but as well as sRNA reagents to s validate the, um, the phenotypes of a screen that we did with Mimixin inhibitors. What I didn't describe is a service that we offer for microRNA um, profiling um, that sort of initiated this work. And again, that's another story. We can come back and talk about that. That's an interesting um, uh, method for uh, identifying potential targets to look at. Uh, this started with some interest uh, by one of our scientists, Yuri Fedorov, who runs our cell um, culture facility. And what he was interested in were the, uh, the genetic pathway regulating differentiation from human mesenchymal stem cells into, in this case, osteocytes. It's a relatively easy cell line. It's a stem cell line. It's an adult stem cell line, something that we're always interested in looking at. What are those cues for differentiation? Um, it grows readily in uh, monolayers, and it's relatively easy to transfect. So again, we were thinking about um, sort of what is the best system to, to look at the pathways for differentiation. Um, the idea behind the experiment was that uh, mesenchymal stem cells can be maintained and propagated, um, shift the, 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 uh, the cell culture media into propagation, uh, sorry, differentiation media, and drive it into osteoblast formation. But can we introduce mimics and look at how, or inhibitors, and look at how the, whether supplementing or inhibiting a particular microRNA might affect that downstream differentiation path? So would it drive it more often into differentiation or maintain it in the undifferentiated state? So the basis of the experiment was at the time of, uh, to plate the mesenchymal stem cells in, in um, 96 well plates at 2,500 or 2.5K, 2 so 2,500 cells per well. And at the time when we were using inhibitors, today the inhibitor uh, collection is uh, more than 700. At the time when we did the experiment, it was about 400, so quite a bit of change in the, the composition of the libraries. Um, these were maintained in propagation media and then shifted into a differentiation media that contained um, factors that would help drive the differentiation process. Um, we look at the early markers of osteoblast differentiation, which is the alkaline phosphatase. So this is an, ex an example of a non-targeting sRNA pool in the presence of the differentiation media. Um, you, you see the, the hallmark of osteo uh, differentiation into osteoblasts. And it's a, a, a high content sort of assay. Based on this screen, uh, Yuri was able to identify 15 inhibitors, so microRNA targets that played a role in increasing differentiation and also one that decreased. And this was based on the alkaline phos uh, phosphatase profile, if it were. Um, he chose to, to follow six of those, um, that collection of 15, so when we repeated the assay um, out of the 15, the six reproduced um, reliably. So we took those um, six uh, of those 15 to, uh, to reanalyze. In this case, now we're going to come back with mimics and see if we can't rescue that activity and look for what we're really looking for sort of opposing effects, right? So if there is an inhibitor that resulted in differentiation, does the mimic then um, maintain the undifferentiated state? Or if an inhibitor resulted in undifferentiated state, does the corresponding mimic? So we're looking for that corresponding sort of phenotype. And in fact, out of those six, we found um, two microRNA uh, inhibitors uh, targeting 489 and 27A that increased AP activity, so again, that differentiated state, and one uh, mimic uh, that actually also drove towards the um, differentiated state relative to our inhibitory control and our mimic control. So the question then that we asked was, was this a, a working in concert with the differentiation media, right? So was it the mimics or the inhibitors alone, or was it some, a combination of, of the... Um, the, the, uh, the dexamethasone, the sorbate, and the glycerol phosphate, right? So what we did was we performed the mimic and inhibitor screen individually, but then also multiplexed in propagation media so that they should be maintained in the undifferentiated state, and then looked at the alkaline phosphatase profile. 
And what we found is that, um, that in fact, you can, you can document sort of a, an additive effect where there's a mimic against 148, an inhibitor against 489 in combination, um, increase that sort of uh, drive or uh, pathway towards differentiation relative to the control and the propagation media. So the idea is that uh, they're working, these, uh, these are microRNAs that we've identified whether by mimics or inhibitors that are involved in this pathway. Um, this is the uh, high content image showing that not all cells obviously, but a, a vast majority of the cells when um, transfected with the inhibitor and mimics were driven towards that osteoblast um, state. So the next obvious question is what are those targets? And as I said before, um, it's not clear. Uh, we have very poor tools at this point to predict targets, but what we use are the in silico methods. Target scan is one. There's several different programs where you can uh, input your microRNA and look at predicted targets, typically based on secondary structure and also the seed region matches. Um, not surprisingly, when you look at target scan for any one of these mimics, um, sorry, the microRNAs, uh, you see literally potentially hundreds of targets, and that's a lot to look at in terms of potential targets. So Yuri also looked at the gene ontology terms, and because we're looking at the osteogenic pathway, he looked at skeletal terms. And so he could narrow that down to uh, 15, 12, and 8 targets, and then looked at those that had um, in the literature some indication of a role in osteogenesis. Okay, so the next step is we have access to sRNA, so we actually can do an sRNA screen against these targets, plus we looked at quite a few others, but we can do a small-scale screen using sRNAs to look and see if we can't validate that particular target. So if we knock down that gene, does it give you the same phenotype that you saw with the mimic um, under the conditions of differentiation? And in fact, what we found was that there were the cordon, and sorry, the, the text here is very poor, but cordon and noggin sRNAs actually demonstrate or mimic the kinds of effects that we saw when we use mimics and inhibitors. And so the, the information is uh, less important, but my point is that we can use this sort of strategy of working with mimics or inhibitors to screen for phenotypes. We can use sort of in silico methods to predict what the potential targets are. Then we can come back with sRNAs to actually validate the targets based on those phenotypes. And then obviously you want to look at mRNA to make sure that you're seeing the, the type of knockdown that you expect. Um, so with that, I'm right a minute over, which is pretty amazing. Uh, um, so I'll take any um, questions that people have, and I have uh, more stories to tell. Um, uh, so if people have interest in particular for difficult to transfect cells or some other strategies, so certainly I can speak to that as well, but I'll take questions um, from the audience about what I described today. Good? Thank you.